Good day, friends. Welcome to Our Power is Within podcast. I'm your host, Chaz Smith, and my mission for this podcast is to inspire you to take your power back, to realize that you are the healer that you have been looking for all along. We can heal in mind, body, and soul. So I'm really excited about this week's challenge, um, as usual. <laughs> what I would love is for us to all just really soak in the gifts of our senses. We have been given this amazing capacity to hear, see, smell, taste, and touch or feel. I know that sometimes for myself, I can get caught up in the day-to-day routines or just move through life with a little less awareness. And this shows up in ways like shoveling food into my mouth when I'm really hungry without really savoring the taste or taking a walk outside with cocoa in the morning out of necessity, but forgetting to look up into the sky or all around and see the beauty that I am surrounded by. Or sometimes not really savoring or basking in the smell of the coffee brewing in the morning. But the truth is, over and over again, I realize that life is better when I really bask in these gifts, when I savor moments and really appreciate the gift of my senses and these epic opportunities to turn the mundane into magic. I hope this week you will bring more awareness, more presence into your world and bask in the luxury of your senses too. Really let that piece of dark chocolate sit on your tongue and just taste it melting over your ma- over your tongue and your mouth and bask in the flavor and sensation of that taste. Or grab a big, beautiful, colorful, scented rose and just inhale it, really taking in the smell. Or when you go for a walk, make sure that you look up and out and just notice the beauty that you are surrounded by. Or perhaps as you're just sitting outside, you notice how the sensation of the breeze feels against your bare skin, tickling the surface. Or maybe you have a nice soft blanket or scarf or something cozy that you can just grab and put in your hands and feel the texture and the soft smoothness rubbing in between your fingertips. There are an infinite number of ways that we can begin to slow down and really bask in our senses. And I hope you'll join me this week. Our guest today is Deanna Hansen. She's the founder of Block Therapy. We talk today all about fascial release, or as we call it today, or refer to it today as blocking, and how engaging in a regular practice of blocking can really shift our life in so many positive ways. She explains what sets the block apart from all the other popular fascial tools on the market these days, and she also shares with us some of her personal story and the successes that she has had in her life since she began incorporating fascia work on her body about 20 years ago. Deanna created the block so that people would have an easily accessible tool that they could use to work through their own adhesions in their body without needing anyone else's help. And the block therapy membership program gives us so many wonderful ideas and options and ways to use the block. So again, we can build our own library and rely on ourselves to do the work. This I have to say, is something I was skeptical of at first because there are so many tools and I've tried, done in the past fascial release work for so many years, but I was curious. And once I did try it, I'm not going to lie, I fell in love, (laughs) which is why I brought Deanna on the show today. I honestly use my block almost every single day and it is time that I give myself that I genuinely look forward to. For me, my blocking session is about conscious breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, presence, and just having this space in my life for the ability to melt in 
and relax my muscles. It feels so good. It brings more body awareness into my life as well as presence. The coolest part is that Deanna is actually offering everyone listening today a fun gift for free. No, like no strings attached. There is a link in the show notes for you to sign up for the free sample program, which is a nine day program and all you need is a towel. So you can still get the experience of fascial decompression with the towel and get a good grasp or feeling for what it means to address your own fascial system. She will explain more about this uh, sample program and the offering uh, in our conversation. So let's go ahead and just get into that. All right, Deanna, thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, Chasmith. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm really excited. Um, Actually, I'm not sure I'm going to share a tidbit of information that you might not be aware of yet, but this conversation that we're about to have and having invited you to the show is going to be the actual first time that I'm having anyone speak on behalf of something to support our healing that is outside of self. Now I know and understand it's still the self that's like taking the action to take the steps to experience the healing through the use of a tool. But if it makes sense, it's a we're kind of focusing on a tool and a system that utilizes a tool that's not just our own body or mind. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I'm very excited. Well, very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. I don't, I don't, um, Yeah, the premise has always been our power is within, but after having my own experience using um, the block, which for everyone listening, we're going to get into what that is and what we're talking about here shortly, but just my own experience, I felt, yeah, I just felt like, okay, this is something different and I love this thing so much for a million different reasons and I was very passionate and excited about it and I wanted to share it. So it was like, okay, this is the first time I feel really compelled to share something that's outside of just our physical body. So, Wow. Well, I'm honored to be your first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure as we kind of get into the dialogue, I'll, there'll be opportunities where I can kind of share with the listeners some of the ways that I found it supported me or that it's unique um, compared to other options that are out there. So um, yeah, so just maybe what we could start with doing uh, for everyone who's listening, Deanna is the founder of what's known as uh, block therapy. And so we're going to kind of talk a lot about um, what block therapy is and the block, which is the tool I'm talking about and the benefits of it today. Um, And maybe what we could do is just start with, I would love if you would share your personal testimony and just some of the main ways that you've experienced healing through using this tool, the block, um, doing fascial release work for yourself. Absolutely. So uh, this journey began for me about 22 years ago. I was 30 years old at the time. And having been trained as a certified athletic therapist here in Canada, I was trained on how to be fit, how to provide fitness um, material for other people, how to rehab bodies, all of these things became part of my focus of my education. And as a result of that education, I, I always focused on deep tissue work to be the way that I interacted with patients primarily. And I I had a really great following of patients, yet my own physical body was really struggling. I was 50 pounds overweight, struggling with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and it wasn't for a lack of effort. I was working extremely hard, learning what I did as an athletic therapist to apply to my own body, and the harder I worked, The bigger I became, the more chronic pain I accumulated, uh, just the more frustrated in general, especially when you're working really hard and other people are getting the results. And yet here I am and I'm struggling and I'm also working with elite athletes. So that was very um, (laughs) off-putting pretty much. So at the age of 30, I made some changes in my life. And as a result of those changes, I started having some severe anxiety attacks. But this one anxiety attack in particular was the seed of everything to come. In the moment, I actually didn't think I was going to survive because I was literally frozen with fear. I couldn't find my breath. So for some reason, I intuitively dove my hand deep into my abdomen. And the first thing I encountered was pain, but the pain brought me out of my crazy thinking. It brought me to the ground. So I knew I was going to live for another day. 
Um, but I also experienced what felt like scar tissue marbled throughout my abdomen, even though I hadn't had any injury or surgery in that area. So suddenly I was having all of these realizations that no wonder why coming home from a five mile run, dripping wet with sweat, my belly still felt cold. And then I thought, well, this is why I can't create a change in this area. No matter how hard I'm working, there's no blood flow getting to this space. So within the first evening, the first thing that I experienced was that I felt really calm. Anxiety was a very prevalent sensation for me on a pretty much 24 seven basis. And for this moment, I'm thinking, wow, like this is actually very peaceful and very calm. And I woke up the next day after that 45 minute or so of working on myself and I still continue to feel calm. So I went to work that, that next day and I had worked on my patients and I came back home and I was really excited to dive back in and explore a little more in my abdomen, what was, what was going on and what I would feel after the second evening of doing this, when I stood up, I felt taller. And when I went to the mirror, I looked at myself and I began to cry because my belly was smaller than it had looked in years. And I was, I was extreme in, in trying to create the change that I wanted in my body, 400 sit-ups a day, Tybo, aerobics, running, weights, I mean, and then dieting, of course. So all of these things actually did change my body, but it actually made it worse. So within two days of doing this, I started to see positive change. This suddenly became the new thing that I would do every day when I came home. And within two weeks, my chronic low back pain was going away. And this excited me so much that I started working in a very similar manner on my patients and very quickly started having phenomenal results with them. Down the road, I started attracting other people that wanted to learn this technique. So for me, it started first as that feeling of peace and calm within myself. And then it was the physical aspect of creating a change in the size and shape of my body and then the chronic pains. And that was 22 years ago. And to this day, I continue to see gifts and changes and improvements in all levels of my being from this work that I've been doing. Wow, that's really amazing. That's a lot. And um, yeah, you've you you said now you're basically pain free, um, anxiety free, and you're not overweight. I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. I would have I, I, my jaw dropped when you said you were 50 pounds overweight because I was like. Oh, she just looks like this naturally like lean athletic person. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> that, that wasn't my situation before. And it's not that I'm out of pain yet. In fact, I don't think that people will ever be out of pain because part of the beauty of this work is we continue to dive deeper and deeper through the layers of our body as we continue to do the work. So about seven years ago, it was amazing because I uncovered an injury that I had when I was seven years old and I really badly damaged my pubic bone and it caused me to grow with a, a certain gait. And I remember seven years ago, my body went through a shift and suddenly I'm like, Oh boy, I think I've now tapped into something really old. And it was incredible. The process because what I don't have anymore is fear of pain. Um, Pain, pain is simply a language that your cells give you to let you know that they need attention. It's the pain fear cycle that really causes us to struggle in life. So now I have no fear. So as soon as I un unleashed this injury from my past, I was actually really excited because I knew what I now had to do to get to this new level. And it did take a while because it was a very severe injury from many years ago that I grew around. However, so many positive changes occurred as a result of me finally getting to this. Um, my, my entire pelvis actually changed its shape to become more aligned. And um, yeah, so it, it, it's not that I, I believe, I don't, I don't think we'll ever be fully out of pain. Pain and pleasure are two sides of the same coin, but it's, it's the fear that we get to remove with this process, which is really, really empowering. Mm -hmm. When you speak of pain though, are you referring to just like more acute pain or chronic pain? Cause there is, a, there's a difference, right. From being in pain 24 seven versus like having acute pains come up or, you know, as you say, in all of your blocking, like we're pain seekers. So we're literally blocking to find the pain in order to like kind of melt into it and release some of it. So that's yeah. very different from like walking around or being debilitated or not being able to live your life from chronic pain. 
Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yes. Pain, pain is again, the way I see pain, it's, it's really more a language of the cell and it's, it's giving you information. So if we are in debilitating chronic pain, that's because so much of our body, so many of our cells in our body aren't being properly fed and clean and they struggle. Um, as we start going through this repair process and start bringing ourselves back to proper alignment, then the, the pain is a very different sensation. And, and we do teach people to become pain seekers because we want to pull the deeper pains up to the surface so that we can actually get rid of them. So we continue to rid ourselves from the pain, but there's just layers and layers and layers of pain that are trapped deeper than what we're consciously aware of that down the road can become things like disease. Because with pain, you also get stagnancy and congestion, and that creates an acidic environment, which can also attract negative things to grow inside our body. So to really just understand the value of what pain is, pain is really the baby crying. It's, it's yourself saying, hey, mom or dad, you're asking me to perform a function or to do, your, to do a job for you, but you're not giving me everything that I need to be able to thrive. So um, I, I view pain as, as really just the baby crying and it's something to be um, focused on in a positive way with a specific process so that we can actually pull it up and then move to that deeper level of pain. So we continue to clear out all of the past. And ultimately the goal is that we have every single one of our trillions of cells in correct position. It's when the cells migrate away from home, from their rightful position, that they start undergoing issues, pain being the first signal. And if we ignore that pain, as typically we're taught to do, we, we mask pain or we posturally avoid it instead of focusing on it and saying, oh, hey, you're here. Let me do something helpful to um, rid you of this issue that you have. Um, then, we, then we end up accumulating more and more pain if we don't actually address it properly. And then that can become a problem down the road. Right. And you, when you're talking, okay, so as we're talking about all this, this is all pre-block. So you're using, my my assumption is your hands at the time to work on yourself and your clients in a specific yes. way? Yeah, for about the first 10 years, it was it was only with my hands as well as my hands on my, my clients. And then about 10 years later, uh, block therapy came to be. I did try teaching people to use their hands on their own bodies. Um, and I do now in my in my membership, but there's a lot of limiting factors to only using your hands. We, for, first of all, we need to go very deep in the tissue. And with the block, very, very simple to do, not as simple with the hands. And some people don't have the strength or they might have pain in their hands, which also limit them from being able to use their hands in their own tissue. Sure. Or they can't reach certain part, parts of their body. Exactly. Yes. In, a, right. in an effective way. Yes. Um, so, all right. Well, in the world, like in the world of fitness and the realms of fitness and um, rehab and all that, you know, physical therapy, um, there has already been this, there's been it for a long time, an understanding of the need to address fascia. And there's a lot of other tools on the market. And some of them are specifically made to address fascia. Some are just random tools that people have gotten creative and learned how to use to address um, their fascia. But like, how does the block stand apart? Like what drove you or what inspired you to create this specific tool? And how can you explain its uniqueness? So initially, when I was working with my clients, I coined the term fluid isometrics to give meaning to the technique that I was using with my hands that I, that I intuitively developed and then started teaching to other therapists. So fluid isometrics is really a form of decompressing the fascia. Block therapy is the self-care version of fluid isometrics. So really what I was attempting to do was pattern what I was doing with my hands in a way that could be effective as well to using the block. So for example, if you're using say a fascia roller and you're rolling on the surface, that would be more in line like getting a typical massage where there's linear strokes um, and, and we're working more on those surface layers. The real root of the issue when it comes to fascia lies at the bone. Because as we start tipping off balance, the fascia will grip and adhere to bone with a force up to 2,000 pounds per square inch. It's an incredible force. And I first learned that um, with John Barnes' uh, myofascial release 
when I was reading his book, he, he was the one that I first learned that that 2000 pound per square inch force was very real. And it resonated right away because I was already diving into my own body and recognizing the absolute ridiculous strength of how our body is held out of alignment. What I've come to understand along the way is it's a magnetic connection. So it's really about unlocking the magnetics in the body that hold us out of alignment. And in order to do that, we have to get to the bone. So if we're moving on the surface, we're going to stay on the surface with our tool. First of all, it's made initially, it was made from cedar. Now it's made from bamboo, both of which are similar to density of bone. So if we want to actually get all the way through the layers of fascia, we need something similar in density to be able to reach that something more porous made of plastic. Again, it's not going to be able to drive through those layers of adhesions that the fascia develops as we start falling out of alignment. Also, the manner in which we use the tool, we're never moving on the surface. We are sinking into the tool combining that with teaching of proper diaphragmatic breathing. So there's two reasons for this. It's all about melting through adhesion. So I just want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about diaphragmatic breathing. If we have been conscious breathers diaphragmatically lifelong, basically every single cell in our body is going to be receiving proper amounts of blood and oxygen flow, as well as being detoxed fully and completely. And if that's the case, our body is heated properly so we can send blood to all of the cells in the body. However, the challenge is that pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. So our bodies are meant to survive, so we're still going to breathe. But if we're not working the diaphragm muscle consciously, the muscles of the upper chest take over. These are the secondary muscles. And they're useful if we're really working the body hard the goal would be to start breathing through the belly, then integrate the lower ribs and then the upper ribs. However, most people today are solely breathing from the muscles of the upper chest. So I like to compare this as being like the upper chest muscles is like a space heater compared to a furnace. So I live in a 30 story building and it can get really, really cold here in Winnipeg. Like let's say it's minus 30 Celsius. If there's no heat in the building and I have a space heater, I can literally only even heat one room in my apartment. If you turn on the building's furnace, you heat the entire building. So breathing diaphragmatically is like turning on your body's furnace. So most people, because they're breathing from the wrong place, their bodies are cold. And also, if you think of how, when, when we blow up a balloon fully, the balloon almost defies gravity it's round, it glows. That's how our cells should be providing we're breathing diaphragmatically with every single breath. Now take out half that air, the balloon becomes dense, it wrinkles, dust and dirt can accumulate in the creases and it falls heavily to the ground. That's ultimately what's happening to the body if we're not conscious diaphragmatic breathers. So basically we're becoming shorter and wider and dirtier within our own tissue, but really what's happening is we're becoming colder. So these adhesions develop between the layers of fascia to try to stop us from tipping over. We're dominant on one side, so I'm right-handed. I think 70% of the population are right-handed. When you look at the average right-handed person, they tend to shift their weight over to the left side to keep that right side free for action. And the fascia system um, we, we haven't really addressed this. What it is, is it is the interconnection of every single cell in the body supporting our full alignment. So if we aren't using proper foundations in our own body to keep us upright and we start tipping over to one side, that's why the fascia will develop adhesions and grip onto bone to try to stop us from tipping. Those adhesions, though, block blood and oxygen flow to cells. And that's ultimately why we go through pain, aging, and disease. So with block therapy, the focus is that we heat the body through the combination of turning on the internal furnace, the diaphragm, combined with holding the block in a specific position for a minimum of three minutes. Pressure over time creates heat. So we do that on the surface and we combine that with turning on the furnace, and then suddenly we become very efficient at melting through the adhesions between the layers of fascia to promote blood and oxygen flow to cells previously blocked.
That's a really awesome explanation. Thank you. I know we, uh, I'm like, I was thinking, yeah, sometimes when I kind of already understand something, I'm like, oh, we have to start at the basics here for everyone else listening. Um, and, and, and also, okay. So yeah. So my, you talked about the diaphragmatic breathing, um, the melting through adhesions. And in my experience, I think that's one of the really awesome parts is for me, when I sit down and set time aside to do blocking, I'm not just thinking about the benefits of, um, the fascia that I'm you know working, but I'm thinking about the benefits of that time dedicated to like, conscious breathing presence, like being here and now with my body. So there's a multitude of benefits that you could experience just from setting that time aside, even beyond the benefits of the fascia that we're working. Absolutely. And I've always said this is a, a therapy an exercise and a meditation all built into one practice. And, and the lovely piece of it is you do this work lying down. You can certainly do it sitting. You can do it in bed, though, and you can do it on a floor lying down. And as you're connecting to the breath, we're really sparking the parasympathetic nervous system so that we get into that rest and digest mode. When I was in my 20s and I was trying to force my body into submission, I mean, that's what I was ultimately doing is I was forcing it. And the body doesn't like being forced. It wants to be persuaded. So this is a very persuasive process. It's a very feminine process with incredibly profound benefits. And you can do it in a very passive way where let's say somebody's really debilitated, they can't get out of bed. You can do it in bed and not go through much movement or um, basically just lying there and focusing on the breathing is going to create change. But you can also take it to a different level and create more of an exercise component with this. There's a lot of classes that we have where we add in isometric holding while on the block, which is incredibly effective at pulling the cells back to correct alignment. So for example, if we're working in the front of the body in the hip flexor area, um, we work the block in that area as we also lift that leg up and we hold it. So we're really, really focusing on the glutes while we're focusing on blocking the front part. We age in a forward rotational direction. So we're basically compressed in the front. And so lots of people have pain in the back of their body, but it's really the front of the body that needs to be released first because we've become this almost the C shape. You know, everybody's body is, is so contracted forward that we need to create the release in the front of the body first and then pull the body the body's tissue back into correct alignment, which we can do through that isometric work, which again, is more of that exercise focus. And people can certainly work up a sweat doing this work. Um, yet you can also do it in a very relaxed, restorative way as well. So that's the beautiful part of this. You can, you can really make it what you want it to be. Right. And I love that you speak to the concept of the pain that people often feel pain in the back of the body, but it's the front that needs addressed first. This is so true. And when you think about it, and when you go in for a typical massage, what is your typical massage? They spend, if it's a 60 minute massage, they spend 50 minutes on your back side, and then they flip you over for those like last 10 to 15 minutes, almost always. And you feel good initially in the moment, but there's not lasting change because we're still not addressing the actual root cause. And um, that's really cool that you're doing the release in the front while strengthening the back. Cause yeah, I have a background in, um, exercise fitness and all that good stuff. And that's totally something that we would always try to teach people is like releasing the front. And then when you do that, you have more access to be able to like address and strengthen the muscles in the back, the corresponding muscle groups. Um, and it made me think of this concept of stop chasing pain, um, because what a lot of us do, and I know there's a lot of people out there who have had and suffered from chronic pain, who have tried other various kind of fascial release tools, the, um, some of the other ones you've spoke about, and they don't have good luck with them. And then they have this really negative perception of all these tools as a whole or addressing this system as a whole. But what I've often experienced and witnessed is that what we do is we go straight to the pain point and we think that we need to like dig into, you know, you learn that and like when you go to get massage, like, oh, I got a knot in my shoulder. Will you dig into it? But often 
um, there's referred pain. And often the point of pain where we think we're feeling the pain is rarely the actual problem area. Exactly. And I mean, again, if you think of that 2000 pound per square inch force of the seal of the fascia, like that's what we're, that's what we're having to deal with. And I do a lot of um, assessments where people, for example, have scoliosis. And what I've learned along the way is really it's the limbs, the calves and the feet, the forearms and the hands. These are the areas of the body that are the furthest away from the engine, the diaphragm. So because we're talking about freezing, like how fascia freezes our body out of alignment, if we don't address the limbs properly, again, as you're mentioning, like, we'll, we'll be chasing that pain. So people coming for our, or dealing with, say, low back issues, whether it's a herniated disc, whether it's spondylolisthesis, or just chronic pain from, uh, you know, just incorrect alignment, if we don't look at what's going on in the calves and the feet, as well as the forearms and hands, then you're, you're going to be needing to consistently work on the issues as opposed to getting to the root cause so that you can actually move deeper in your body to address older things that will eventually come up as you start dealing with these surface things. And again, the body's riddled with pain. If you press anywhere in your body hard enough, you're going to feel pain. And it's because our bodies are simply, I, I don't believe there's anybody on this planet that has every single cell perfectly aligned in their body because we're constantly being flogged by gravity, stress, injury, how our bodies grew. Um, there, there's so many components to it. So um, it, it is so important to really look at the body as a whole and approach it in a holistic way. And part of block therapy too, it's not just about lying on the tool and diaphragmatically breathing. It's also about building proper alignment. We have certain foundations in the body that are designed to support proper cell alignment. But again, people simply haven't really been given that information consistently throughout life. So this is part of this process so that we can release the old pattern, fill that tissue up with blood and oxygen flow, and then own that new alignment and continue to take steps forward in that manner. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for explaining that. So, okay, I'm going to backtrack for just a, a quick moment, but I'm just so curious. How in the world did you come up with this idea to make this block out of wood, first cedar and then bamboo? Like, how did your mind process this and think, I'm going to create this tool so that people can do this on themselves and it needs to be similar to the density of bone? You know, kind of like how the initial process began for me, it wasn't something I thought up. This is not, nothing about this is something that came from Deanna's brain. I opened myself to this information and I allowed it to flow through me. So it was about 2010, I believe. Um, I was tired because I was working eight to 10 hours a day on patients and then coming home and working on my own body. So you know, I was really using a lot of physical energy in my life. So once a week, I had uh, a lovely, lovely yoga teacher come and give me a private session. And it was always a restorative session. I was, I loved lying on the floor. So she was getting me into a sideline twist over a bolster. And she cautioned me that this gets really, really deep and to be careful. So I'm in this twist and I'm thinking, well, I mean, for 10 years now, I've been diving my hands so deeply into my own body. I didn't even feel it. Now, Around the same time that this whole journey began for me, I had also started the practice of Iyengar yoga. And I had a wooden rectangular Iyengar yoga block right nearby. And I said, you know what, I want to lie on that instead. And she's like, oh my gosh, like that's, that's way too deep. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to do that. So I grabbed the block, I put it under my, my ribs and I'm going into the twist. And as soon as I do that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't need to use my hands in my body. I can move my body into the block. However, it was rectangular. So it had sharp edges. So there was a bit of limitation with how far and deep I could go. So um, one of my body workers was also a woodworker. And I said, you know what, we need to figure out the size and shape to make this so that it's really, really comfortable to get into the soft areas of the belly and the armpits and the groin and all throughout the body so that we can go as deeply as we need to, to get to the bone, but in a comfortable way. Because if it's too sharp, then we're simply going to, it's, it's going to be too painful and we won't be able to do that. So it was about two years of, um, you know, working with the size and the shape of the tool until I was like, okay, this is exactly as I need it to be. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes think that uh, 
God throws you the right things when you're meant to have them. And the first wood that we tried was cedar. And it was just like, wow, like this just feels so beautiful. As we started to grow, though, we needed to find a better way to supply the world with the demand of blocks. And so I had an engineer do some research. And we also found that bamboo is also similar to density in bone. And we're actually looking at um, making them back here in Canada as well. So we have more than one place making them. And we've just come across elm. And it's also absolutely perfect. So really, it comes down to using natural products that have that um, th that's basically wood or bamboo is a grass, but it feels just like wood when it's, when it's made the way that we've made them. So it, it's all about the density and making sure that, um, again, it's, uh, it, it's going to move through those layers of fascia to get to the root. Absolutely. I love that explanation. That's so cool. That's like a really neat unfolding. And I would say just cause I'm so into like the environment that I love that it, personally, that it's bamboo, just because that's so environmentally friendly, you know? Absolutely. Just, it grows so fast and it regenerates so fast. So I think it's a really great uh, um, source to use uh, for when you're trying to get that that feeling of wood. Yes, it sure is. It's, it's a lovely, lovely tool. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what's interesting from my perspective as a as a, a client who's used this tool now. I'm, I'm not going to I'm just going to put it out there. I was so skeptical when I first learned about this. It probably it took me many, many months before I actually used it because Having a background in this industry, I know there's just always the next gadget, the next tool, the next this. There's literally hundreds of tools on the market that market themselves as like fascial release tools. So I just thought, oh gosh, here's the next the next thing, you know? And then I even had a yoga block, like a, a foam, a hard foam one. And I was like, I can just use my yoga block. Okay. Tried the yoga block, um, doing some um exercises, if you will, that I had already been familiar with. And I'm like, hmm, these edges don't feel good. And I'm noticing that block is rounded. That's genius. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then I actually got gifted the block, um, through, um, through a, a coach and that I had, and, I was very excited. Cause at that point now I'm like, okay, I really want to see what this feels like. I, want to see if this is amazing. And it was instant love. It was instant love. I was like, Oh my God, this feels, Aww. I was so <laughs> nervous. I thought would like, you know, I usually use like a lacrosse ball or a, like I have a ball that's a little bigger than a lacrosse ball. So it's not so acute and so painful. And I, but I thought wood was going to be so much worse, but because it's larger and you're covering a broader surface area, you're still getting deep into the layers, but it's actually mo far more gentle than like a lacrosse ball and way more comfortable. And now also that I've experienced um, using a lot of the block therapy videos and support systems, I have been learning phenomenal approaches or ways to get into positions to address specific areas that are far more comfortable than what I used to do with like holding myself up in certain ways that would, you know, my arms would fatigue or my shoulders would get sore, um, which has been awesome. In addition to that, it, the block therapy has expanded my mind to discovering that I can block areas that I never imagined possible. Never, ever would I have thought to like roll my face all over the lacrosse ball, but yet I can actually like sink into this block on my face, every aspect, <laughs> my, you know, my forehead, my, along my eyes, um, in my sinus line, like, oh my God, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> well, and you know, that that's awesome because I mean, what, what's super cool and exciting for me too, as you know, the inventor of this is I continue to also learn as I, you know, open up my cells and, and my system. And it was, um, back in around probably January or so, um, I had found out that my mother was you know, late November. I found out that my mom was uh, terminal and she passed in March. But um, in that moment, I, I recognized that as soon as I felt that grief of the knowing that she was going to be dying, I, I got very pulled down in my body. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm even having trouble breathing right now. 
So I decided I was going to create a grief class because I was going through grief and I, I felt I needed something a little, a, a bit of a different approach. So I created this chair class. And what was really neat was the one area of the body I had yet to dive into was the very front of the throat. I would work on the um, SCM muscles at the side neck in a specific way, but I never got right on top of the front of the throat. And yet there was this feeling that like this, this stuck energy in the front of my throat because I, I wanted to cry. I, I didn't know what to do. Like I was just struggling there. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to give this a try. And as soon as I did, I thought, oh my gosh, I've been missing this part. So um, that has become for so many a go-to favorite class it's kind, but so incredibly deep. And then when we get to this area, because I've used my hands, I, I also, um, now, now I have in my membership uh, a section where I teach people to use their hands on their own bodies. And I've used my hands a ton in the front of my throat. I've probably spent thousands of hours in that area, but I'd never used the block specifically that way. And as soon as I did, I was like, wow, like I felt a wall of tension in there that I wasn't able to reach with my hands. And afterward, I'm just like, okay, this is my new favorite position. I, I, I couldn't honestly believe the changes so quickly that it created in my whole face. It was, it was just, yeah, it was amazing. So that's the fun part for me too, is I continue to explore the body and dive deeper. And I, I even have a gum health class, which I just use the hands for, but it's all inside of the mouth. And realizing that the palate, the, the very roof of the mouth, how it contracts over time and then affects the, the alignment of the teeth, as well as everything above that. So, you know, that's the support for the brain, for the nasal passages and the eyes. And as soon as I, I shared that last summer, it was almost a year ago now that I did that one, again, just a whole new level of, wow, like, uh, amazing changes for people and the amazing benefits. So I, I really do feel blessed because I, I get to continue to explore and, and share new approaches. Um, whenever there's an area that is like, we just need a little more attention here. We need something else to, to really get to this area. So um, that, that's the fun part for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, Hey, I'm just going to go ahead and second that. I love the, th the front of the throat oh, <laughs> and it's cool. so weird, right? Like if you're just listening to this, you're like, wait, I'm going to like lay the front of my throat on a block. It just sounds like you're going to choke, right? Or <laughs> it just sounds really weird, but it is amazing feeling. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is like with this tool, I'm able to like, yeah, I love these positions that I can get into in the areas of my body that I can address. And it's, Oh, it just feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and, and I, I want to actually, so you mentioned this grief. And so you created this grief class where you were addressing grief and you literally explained how you noticed like this physiological shift in your body when you were going through this intense grief. And there's some, there's a lot of theory. I don't know. I, I call it theory still around the idea that we actually store our emotions and trauma in our fascia. So could you speak to that and how this blocking, because I'd love to talk about all the benefits of blocking and how it really does, um, it does have benefits far beyond just the physical, like purely physical shifts. Yes, absolutely. So pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. So let's say you had a traumatic event when you were 10 years old. If you look at a deer, for example, who um, survives an attack, you'll see that afterward it starts to shake. It's basically expelling all of that adrenaline, all of that fear that came into its body, into its tissue through this action of shaking. We humans don't tend to go through that process. We tend to hold it. We, we freeze. We have a freeze response. So pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. If we don't let that reaction go, now the breath is compromised. So the diaphragm is a plate of muscle that moves up and down in the body. However, if we don't use it that way, the weight of the rib cage, the head, the arms, everything causes the rib cage to collapse in the core. And we don't just collapse linearly, we wind down. So now we have the diaphragm, this plate of muscle that is unable to move in its proper way to feed all of the cells. So however it gets locked, Ultimately, now that isn't allowing the cells, all of the cells in the body, body to be properly fed and clean with oxygen. 
So that trauma ultimately gets stored in the breathing pattern in the body. And as we continue to grow and move forward in our life, how we breathe is based from that incorrect movement going forward. And then because we're magnetic beings, we have a specific charge that continues to attract more and more of that similar energy. So if I was abused as a child, I'm likely going to attract an abusive relationship. It's going to be a pattern that I'm going to continue to repeat through my life. So with blocking, what we're doing is we are getting to those holding areas, those areas that don't have that blood flow, and we're supporting improving blood and oxygen as we're also releasing the diaphragm. So through that whole process of connecting properly to the breath, we start to move that negative energy out of the body. This is really interesting. They did a study in 2014 proving that 84% of weight loss comes through proper exhalation. So here I am in my 20s, athletic therapist, 50 pounds overweight, working really hard, doing all of this activity, you know, d definitely less calories in versus energy expenditure, yet I'm getting bigger. And it's like, okay, well, why are the rules of weight loss not applying to me? And it's because I didn't know how to breathe properly. So whether it's size that gets stuck and stored in the body or emotion or pain, it's all stuck and stored in the fascia in through how it entangles and holds us out of alignment. So as we start releasing those adhesions, the energy that also was stored in that moment of trauma also become expelled from the body. And then we start flooding that space with life with newness, with creation, so that we can actually step into the life that we were born to live as opposed to getting stuck in the past, in the trauma. And funny enough, um, in the fall, we well, September 20th and 21st, and we're just really going to be starting to promote this in the next month, we are actually having a trauma summit so that we can combine other world experts and really um, share different approaches to connecting and releasing your trauma and bring that into a 90 day block therapy program as well so that we can really get to the roots of the issues and uncover it on all levels of mind, body, spirit so people can move forward in a free way. So speaking of like kind of unwinding, um, releasing this, you know, releasing some of these adhesions, getting into these deeper layers, releasing them, releasing energy, uh, we're unwinding, we're unwinding tissue, we're uh, Older, as you explained when you addressed the pelvic, the pelvis area, and you discovered seven years ago, you discovered like this injury from when you were seven. So you're releasing this older stuff. And I understand that sometimes healing doesn't always feel good. It can really be uncomfortable as we unwind tissues or old patterns physically, mentally, or even spiritually. So what are your suggestions for how someone can move through and handle or deal with these uncomfortable feelings and sensations that might arise as they do get into deeper layers of tissue and have these harder experiences uh, come to the surface uh, to release things like old traumas or old injuries? Great question. Um, I have a private Facebook community. We've got uh, well over 7,000 members now, people who have been blocking for years. It's such a beautiful and supportive community. And I think first and foremost, that's the first thing. There's a community here for people to share their experiences as well. So oftentimes, again, it's really the fear. It's not the sensation so much. It's the fear of the pain, the fear of the sensation that really locks us into that negative thinking. So when we understand that pain is really just, again, it's, it's the cell giving you information that it needs attention, then we look at pain from a very different lens and we also have a process to move you through it. So I think it's really the combination of educating people that the healing crisis is part of the body's way of healing. If you've got something that's been locked deep inside for a long time, we have to bring it up to the surface before we can say goodbye to it. But we do it in an, I mean, block, blocking is completely non-judgmental. It's not like you have to go in and rehash, you know, whatever the event was or, you know, all, all of those things. It's, it's just a natural way where the body allows the issue to come up and then we let it go through the process of the exhalation, 
of unraveling that fascia that was locking it in place. But that combined with the community is, I really think, where the magic lies, because when you know that this is normal. So for example, a rib release is a very unique thing to block therapy. Um, not everyone's going to have one. Not everyone is going to have pain with one. Some people have felt like they fractured a rib with one. And so what's really neat was in the very, very beginning when these rib releases started to become you know, prominent in my world, it was like, oh, geez, here we go again. Here we go again. And then, of course, you know, nobody likes to be in pain. However, now because our community is filled with people sharing like, oh, my gosh, once I got to the other side of that rib release, I couldn't believe how much deeper I could breathe, how much better my rotation was. I feel taller. I look narrower. Like there's all these positive things as a result of having them. So now some people are like, well, I haven't had one yet. When am I going to have one? So <laughs> it's really lovely how basically people's perception of something that used to be something they feared is now something they want because of the benefit for it. And as you become a blocker and more seasoned to understanding good pain and becoming a pain seeker, then pain isn't something that you fear. It's really something that you embrace. And now when the healing crises come into my life, I'm just like, oh, awesome. Like I'm finally letting more deeper stuff go. So I'm just going to be cleaner than I was even before that. So um, that's, it's the recognition of, of the value of the healing crisis. And again, the the community support to just know that this isn't happening to just you. It, it's happening to, to many. And once on the other side, there's going to be so many gifts and blessings. Yeah, absolutely. What is a rib release? So basically um, when ribs are properly aligned, it should be like a well-made deck where there's space between each rib. And if you think about the body, the heart is the most important organ we can be brain dead in our body and still have a body that's alive because the heart is alive. However, when the heart dies, the entire body dies. So by that, the heart is the most important organ to be protected. And part of what creates the support of the rib cage is the fact that there's space in it. So if I get punched in the rib cage, it has fluidity. It's not a hard shell, like a, a piece of glass that's going to break if you drop it. It's, it's we're, we're designed to bounce. However, what happens when we're not conscious breathers is over time we compress. Gravity is constantly pulling us down toward the ground. Essentially, we become shorter and wider as we age. So that compression takes away the space between the ribs and then the container becomes hard. So as we start the process of block therapy and we start melting through the adhesions, then the ribs are designed to basically move back into correct alignment. And sometimes it can release with a pop. So the entire two ribs let go. And the very first thing that happens is inflammation because the body is designed to rebuild itself when given what it needs. So we have this rib release. Now there's all, this, all these cells that are suddenly like opened up inflammation goes in, but infl inflammation also creates um, pressure and pain. So it's part of the healing process, but because it's the ribs, every movement, you feel it like coughing, yeah. laughing, going to the bathroom, trying to move. I mean, and, and so you're aware of it. And again, for some people, it's, it's a non-event for other people. It can be depending on the, you know, what kind of trauma or how much was released all at once. It can feel, um, well, again, some people have thought they've broken a rib. However, we have a process. We actually have a video in the starter program, how to handle a rib release. And I've had to get on calls with people to guide them through. But as long as you understand the process and what to do with it, then we can guide you through typically very quickly. And the last thing we want to do is we, want, we don't want to put ice on it and stop moving because we've just created this heating. So we want to continue adding more energy to the system as opposed to icing it and stopping that whole process. So um, we, we hold people's hand through that all the time. And, and that's, it's, it's a common occurrence, but I think probably maybe only 10% of the people actually experience one, but now we've got such a large community of people blocking all over the world that, uh, I mean, I, I encounter these on a regular basis. Interesting. Okay. So it's not, um, a sublux strip. No, it's, it's not yeah, a sublux okay. strip. Yeah. When your okay. when your rib is out, that's, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, and gotcha. often these, these occur in the lower floating ribs as opposed ah. to right at the attachment at the back, which is um, common when you have a subluxed rib. 
Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying it. That was helpful because I hear you talk about it on your videos all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and again, as long as people are aware that it's a possibility, then if it happens, then here's the approach. And, and again, we've got huge community support around that. Right. Which again, reduces the fear, takes the fear away. Yes. Keeps you, keeps the power in, in the person. Exactly. So, okay. So what would you suggest are ways that people can address their own fascia and, and benefit? Um, maybe they're just not ready to make the next step. Maybe they listen to this podcast and they're thinking about it, but they're just not sure. Cause they've had, you know, a lot of negative experiences with all the other tools and systems in the past. And they're just still a little apprehensive, but they're like, okay, maybe I can address this again. Like what would, where would you say is a good starting point for somebody? Well, as a free gift, we can offer anybody the sampler program. It's nine videos covering the full body, which also includes uh, alignment training um, using a rolled up towel. So really it's about fascia decompression. So block therapy is the tool that we use for fascia decompression and the hands. However, a rolled up towel is really effective as well. Um, not as effective as the block, but we have so many amazing testimonials from people that have just used our sampler program. And then from there, if you want to step into the next level, you can certainly uh, get the starter program. Um, so very, very happy to share that as a free gift to all of your listeners. Awesome. Yay. We love free <laughs> gifts. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Um, and then I would love to hear your insight on how much time is a reasonable amount of time to dedicate to, to blocking? Do we need to do it every day? Um, and do we ever get to a place where we can actually start to reduce how much time we spend on it? Oh, great question. So most of the people that start blocking, this does become a lifestyle, partly because A, it's so easy to do, and because people absolutely love the calming effect and the side effects, and there's just so many, and they never end. Um, however, at a minimum, if you can commit 15 minutes a day, you're definitely going to see changes. If you can do 30 minutes a day plus an alignment training video, which is how I've laid out most of my classes in my membership, then you're going to be making changes continually and probably fairly quickly in your life. Um, but you absolutely do get to a point where you can pull back on the amount because once you've learned how to breathe diaphragmatically, chances are you're not going to revert back. We are actually born to breathe this way. But again, pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. So initially, you've got to train that right action, that right habit again. And once you do, chances are you're not going to lose that. Also, the alignment training piece. So for example, if you're sitting in front of a computer for 30 years in a slouched position, that's going to be the reason for a lot of your struggles. Once you learn proper alignment, it's really hard to go back to negative alignment. And I mean, learning proper alignment is about changing habits and, and it's a continual thing to become aware of. But if you're always shifting to one side of your leg and you learn that, no, we should be standing with equal weight on both feet, chances are you're not going to fall back into those negative old habits. So as you start to integrate breathing and proper alignment into your life, then there's less adhesions developing that need to be addressed. Having said that, we're also... I believe multidimensional beings and we've got so many layers and layers and layers of stuff and trauma to be pulled forward that if you do continue to do it, like for me, 22 years in, I've come so far on my journey, but I know I still have so much further to go. And that's actually probably one of my favorite things about this every single year, new gifts, new, new, wonderful things happen to my body. I mean, the flexibility, I'm, I'm 53 and the flexibility and the strength I have and even the way I, I look compared to when I was in my 20s. I always say anti-aging isn't about looking 20 when you're 50. It's about proper cell alignment. So the more I continue to understand where my cells are supposed to be positioned, that is shown through the way that we move, the way that we look, the way that our body functions. So that's the thing, like when, when people start to dive into this, most people don't let it go because it, it becomes a lifestyle. Now, having said that, you can certainly skip a few days here or there. Um, but again, it's, it's the habit that we are really trying to create. So initially, the daily practice is where you're going to find the most benefit. Um, but then as time goes on, you can certainly create change. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I would, I'd say as a testament, like I actually don't look at this as something I have to do. I look at it as something I get to do something that I'm like, it's, it really feels like self care. Like it's me time. It's just, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm the first to admit that there are some self care things that I know are good for me, but I don't want to do, but I do them anyways, but this, I actually like want to do and look forward to doing. Well, and because you can do it lying down, I mean, like, uh, you know, the sideways position, I, I used to be like, I used to carry my 50 pounds of weight in my core. So I, I never had a waist. I used to always want it. So that sideways position for me, you know, I'll, I'll lie for an hour, um, 30 minutes on one side, 30 minutes on the other side while I watch a TV show. So it's, it's so simple to bring into your life as well that you don't have to be actively doing a class every day to still be blocking. You can have it behind you when you're sitting on a chair to encourage the body to sit upright. Every night when I go to bed, I put it under something. Um, so that's the ease of it as well. Um, you don't have to take time out of your day to block all the time. Right, right. Yeah, you're learning how to incorporate into elements of life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh -huh. I used to call um, my sessions, I used to say, I'm going to have movement and mobility night because I used to call it mobility, you know. Um, of course, at the time, I would probably was grabbing like a foam roller. So I still had good intentions, though. But I would like I'll put my I would kick, um, sit down on my butt, lean back into the couch and like kick my feet up and like do my calves or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I still uh, do that now with my block. <laughs> wonderful. And the thing is the calves, again, like they're such a major cause site. So it takes nothing to do. You can be reading a book. You can be having a conversation with somebody on the phone and you can still be doing this work. So um, that's the ease of it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and the nice thing about when you're doing it, when you're reading is if you're stay present and conscious and you're focused on still breathing, that's a really great thing because um, it's been known that many of us have a habit of holding our breath when we read hmm. or holding our breath when we're really focused, you know, like if you're really focused on a on a task and you, you we like kind of just hold our breaths, like people who kind of tend to carry more tension in general. So it helps me to also like be mindful and just like place my hand on my belly when I'm reading and maybe I have the block on my calves and now, now I'm getting the benefit of multiple things all at once. Excellent. Yeah. I remember the very, very first yoga class I ever took. I had a great teacher. I was so fortunate. And about every 30 seconds, she would remind us to breathe. And every time she reminded us, I was like, wow, I'm not breathing. So that really became an integral foundational piece of this process for me. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We, we do need to be reminded sometimes until it becomes a new, our new, our new habit. Yes. Uh huh. Um, Okay, so I ask everybody this question, and it can relate to the block or not at all, but if you had one message, only one message that you were allowed to share with the world for the rest of your life, what would you want to share? Be kind to yourself. I, I think so many of us, we, we look after everybody else before we look after ourselves, and you know, like on, on the airplane, I mean, if the oxygen mask comes down, you're, you're told to put that on your own face first. And I remember hearing that when I was younger and thinking, well, if I have kids beside me, though, shouldn't I look after them? And it's like, well, yeah, but if you die in the process, then you're no good to anybody. So if we can really turn all of that energy first in on ourselves and look after ourselves, then we can be that much better for everyone else in our lives. And I think especially women were so designed to care for others first. So I, I would say everyone turn that love inward on yourself and then just notice what happens to the rest of your life and the rest of your relationships and the people around you, how much more you can, how, how much greater capacity you have for them because you're first and foremost looking after your own cells and your own self. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And what ways can people connect with you personally? blocktherapy.com um, or our private Facebook community, uh, Block Therapy Community. And uh, you just have to ask to join and we'll let you right in. I have two incredible therapists that I've trained that are manning that. Um, but blocktherapy.com is where you can find me. And um, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm very accessible to people that have questions and need, and need guidance. I love it. Yay. Thanks so much for meeting with me today and sharing all this wonderful, juicy information with me and everyone who's listening. And I'm really excited to just share this with people because, yeah, I'm all about really empowering people to take their power back. And 
I just love this tool. I love it. I did not, I, like I said, I was skeptical at first, but it proved me wrong in every capacity. And I just, I really look forward to the time I get to spend, um, with my block and the gift that I'm giving myself on a, on a day-to-day basis. And I hope that there's people out there listening who will get to have that experience now that we've had this chat. Uh, thank you so much, Chasmeth. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. All right, you guys, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please remember that if you are listening to this episode on Apple Podcast, please, if you have not already done so, take a moment right now to scroll down and click the five-star rating and leave a quick review um, to help me spread the message of empowerment, healing, and possibility. Taking 60 seconds of your time to take to do this review and rating helps other people who find my podcast to pursue an interest and curiosity in listening to it, and it might help them with their healing journey also. Um, You can also share this episode with a friend who could benefit from blocking. And as always, don't forget about the link for the free sampler program in the show notes. Now, I hope you will go savor your census. And until next time, you know the drill. Make this week great.